Good morning, Austin. Hey, Dad. How are you today? Doing good. It's uh, waiting on this uh, weather that's supposed to hit us. Thank you uh, for the great weekend. It was uh, nice to uh, be able to come down and be with you and Lauren and to celebrate her 34th birthday. Uh, Mom and I's goal was to make her feel special, and I hopefully she did. We were able to, uh, you know, let you guys get out a little bit. And, but I got to be honest, she threw me for a curveball first thing in the morning when <laughs> I asked you to figure out what type of cake she wanted, and she said uh, she wanted a chocolate strawberry cake. I'm thinking, chocolate, <laughs> strawberry, where are we going to get that? Or how are we going to make it? Well, mom pulled it off with the help of Remy, your little little one. But, uh, yeah, we had a little bit of strawberry uh, icing and strawberries on it. We had the candles, and each kid got a balloon for her, and we had the party hats. And I think that uh, I saw a big smile on her face when she got home from work. So hopefully she enjoyed it, and then you got to take her out. How'd that work? Well, you know, having four kids, you know how challenging it is to find just, you know, a glimpse of time, you know, you know, no matter, you know, um, you know, so for me, you know, it was, uh, it was good to be able to take her out to, um, a restaurant in downtown Mobile. And we went to, um, you know, it was at the top of a, uh, a high riser in Mobile and uh, we were just, you know, ate some good food and we had, um, the ability to share some good conversation. So we were just appreciative that you guys were able to come and watch them and give us some time to, you know, just be. <laughs> we had a special treat because we got to take the four kiddos to the movies. We went to see um, Migration, which was cute. But uh, I think I maybe watched the kids more than I watched the movie because I just would look down the row. Mom was on one end. I was on the other. All four were between us. And I saw Remy, your little one, sitting on Gigi's lap and eating popcorn and more concerned about who was getting gummy bears and she wasn't. And then, uh, you know, your son Abel sitting on the edge of his chair, eyeballs as big as silver dollars, just locked in on the movie. And I said, man, that looks just like Austin. And then there's Harper who was uh, moving around, couldn't sit still, eating her popcorn, <laughs> eating some gummy bears, asking questions. And then Ella, the eight-year-old who was next to me, just sat there and pretty much took the movie in. I thought, boy, she's really grown up. But I know you know this, man, you're blessed. Uh, those four kids are beautiful, they're smart, they're healthy, and you and Lauren do a great job because you love them. And, uh, boy, just a great opportunity there. So hopefully, uh, you know, we wanted Lauren and you to be able to stay out and uh, stay overnight in a hotel. But in between the weather and, and a couple other things that have occurred, uh, we weren't able to do that, and so we had to get out uh, early Sunday morning and, I guess the weather is hitting uh, first in Mississippi because your brother Clay got about four inches last night. And, you know, that's a state of emergency in Mississippi. And it's also coming our way here, I think, late this afternoon in Alabama. And just makes me think, Austin, remember those mornings we used to drive <laughs> to uh, winter workouts in Ypsilanti, Michigan? I, I don't know. There might have been 12 inches of snow and sleet. And we just got in a car and went. And for my yep. days growing up in Pittsburgh, there were no different way of life. Days. Yeah, I mean, canceling school and all that that didn't exist. You put chains on your tires and you went went right through it. But <laughs> we had to get home quickly because we received some um, tough news yesterday. Um, Mom's dad uh, was not doing well, and it looked like that they were going to, um, you know, have him probably pass in the next 24 hours. And so mom hurried up. We got back up here and we got her on an airplane and uh, she ended up making it last night. And she texts me uh, shortly after midnight our time that uh, her dad passed. It's been a heck of a year for him, as I know you followed it too. 2023, he's been in and out of the hospital and finally had to start battling cancer, which didn't kill him. But his uh, organs just didn't have the strength to battle it. And last night he went home. And, uh, you know, just to think about uh, he's dancing with our father right now in that uh, circle dance with the father, the son, the spirit and experiencing that love. He's meeting back up with his wife that passed when she was 52 and probably holding hands. But, you know, maybe think of some stories of uh, Paul, mom's dad. And uh, I think of the one when I used to come home from uh, uh, playing some pro ball in the, in the off season, would go visit him and 
they'd say, let's go catch in the front yard. And, you know, we'd start, and I'd give him some nice lofted balls, and then i start putting some zip on it. And he didn't like that. He said, I don't want to catch anymore. She's breaking my hands. All right, always complaining. But then one day, his favorite memory, Austin, he never let me live it down, is he beat me in 21 one time playing basketball. Get out of here. Honest. I don't know how he did it, but he never let me live it down. He never would play again. He just said, no, no, I beat you in basketball. And then the third was we were on a vacation one time down in Hilton Head, and I was in the batting cage taking some cuts. I said, hey, boss, man, take some cuts. And uh, he, I can remember putting that red helmet on. It would squeeze his cheeks. And he got in there. And I think for 75 cents, you get maybe 10, 10 swings. Well, I don't know what happened to the machine, but he must have got 25. <laughs> and it was just like rapid coming at him. And he was exhausted when he got out of there. Just the other day when I talked to him on the phone, he's in the hospital. I said, hey, do you want to go take some cuts at the batting cage just to try to lighten his spirits? He goes, no, I don't think I can do that anymore. <laughs> but then mom sent me a picture this morning that uh, you know really hit me. To be honest with you, it brought tears to my eyes. She sent me a picture of a box of donuts, and she said he's still here. If you knew, uh, which I know you did, Grandpa, he loved his donuts. And not the donuts that you, know, you and I would want to go to the bakery and get. He'd get those softies, they were called, at the grocery store. The ones when you go buy them in your cart, you're like, who eats those donuts? Well, the boss man ate those donuts. And so seeing that picture this morning just was uh, touching to the heart. So what I thought would be appropriate, Austin, for both your mom and, and my wife and for grandpa would be to uh, for us to dedicate our first podcast to Joe the Boss Man Termini. And we just thank you for all the memories. Yeah. And thank you for loving my wife, your daughter. And uh, I know today you're, you're smiling and happy and at rest in peace. So... Uh, we love you, boss. Austin, how'd we get here? <laughs> I would have never guessed that we would be doing this, but, uh, you know, usually the things that we do uh, aren't, uh, you know, what we foresee. But mm -hmm. um, after taking a step back, what I'm able to see is we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my whole adult life, I've gotten in the car and driven home and I call you. And we, we get into good conversations. We talk about all types of things in our lives. You know, good things, bad things, things on the surface level, things that have great depth. And uh, we're just taking it and sharing it with people. You know, good news, which is what the gospel's called, requires good conversation. And uh, I can say as your dad, it's an honor to uh, have those conversations with you on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as you said, sometimes they're exhilarating and sometimes they're depressing. But uh, I'll take both because uh, it's with you. And hopefully uh, our time as a father-son will encourage others as well. And it's also, to me, Austin, a time where we can start putting language around things we learn. Because you and I are kicking some stuff around that we've really never had uh, learned in our life. And you start to hear things and you're like, wow, it's really revolutionary. Um, and changes your life. So, you know, putting language around some of those things so we can better communicate it to other people. And and then when you realize that, you know, as a father, son, that my story has affected you and your story's part of me. And uh, when you look at the big picture, though, where we can find rest is that, uh, you know, his story, which is the history of both of our stories, that we... Uh, you know, are a part of what Papa has designed from before time ever began. So it's uh, it's going to be exciting. Again, I know there's people out there that know us well that would say that, why would you choose a podcast to do that, though? So what would you say to them? Well, you know, like I said, it's just uh, taking our conversations and making it public or inviting people in. By no means do we sit here and think that we have all the answers and that, you know, we're the smartest people and we're write about everything. We, we're sitting here trying to, you know, flesh out this life. You know, what I do know is we both search after the heart of the Father, and we desire to take what we're learning and apply it to the rest of our lives. And um, so for me, it's getting in those conversations and um, just seeing where God takes us. Um, 
on a personal note, you know, having four kids and, and truly believing in, um, you know, generations and uh, for words like legacy, you know, I want to create kind of a library or some type of vault of my spiritual growth and your spiritual growth to pass on to my kids. You know, obviously we get into some good conversations now, but, um, you know, as they grow, I want them to look and see, you know, this is where my dad was or my grandfather was. And um, this is what God was doing in his life. And for generations to come, be able to pass that along and and plant seeds and help them grow as they're walking mm-hmm. through their own stuff. You know, we're going to be very vulnerable and we're going to uh, be honest. Um, but I know our hearts and our hearts are to love people um, and to use our lives to help people walk out their story. You know, I think about two words that mean a lot to me as we are starting this podcast is it's a place of discovery. We hope we can help people discover who they really are, what they already have, how to live from it. And the other is to rethink things. You know, a friend of mine has a podcast that he talks a lot about rethinking. And I think it's uh, been a challenge for me to to look at stuff that maybe I have listened to and I've adopted in my own life because someone's told me, but I've never really rethought it and owned it for my own. And so rethinking things will be, you know, another, I think, important part of this podcast. And then just a place, like you said, swap stories and share life together. And it's going to be exciting to be able to do that. I know one of the things that you and I have always hoped that we'd be able to do, and that is to coach together. And there's still time. But for whatever reason, that opportunity has not presented itself. But Papa being the unique lover that he is of our lives uh, has maybe presented this podcast as a way that we can, you know, share the sidelines together. So with uh, excitement and uh, being my pleasure to introduce to you the new podcast called Awaken Kingdom Culture, where hearts and minds come alive one story at a time. My name is Ken Karcher, and I'll be your host. Alongside me today is my son, Austin Karcher, who will be our co-host. Austin, when I thought about where to start, I thought it would be best for us to try to be as transparent as we can and share a little bit about our life. And so there's no better place to start than in the beginning. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, for those of Uh, People that live there also refer to themselves as people that are from the city of champions, Penguins, Steelers, Pirates. Now, the Pirates haven't won much lately. I'm living in my 70s, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's it's still for me the city of champions because that's where I grew up. And, uh, you know, I think back to some of my fondest memories, those first first 18 years of life, the growing up years, I think of – a couple with mom and dad, the one my mom told me that I remember is, you know, I was just born. I was actually uh, just uh, brought into this world. And my dad said to my mom, let's name him Ken. And my mom says, well, why Ken? And my dad said, because Ken Karcher is a good sports name. <sighs> wow. To think that my dad figured out that sports would be the, the, uh, the defining thing of my life. That's pretty interesting. And then I think of a, a memory that I had with dad and when I was probably, I don't know, seven or eight years old, I was downstairs in our basement. We were watching the Philadelphia Sixers, 76ers, play basketball. And uh, my favorite player was Julius Irving at the time. We didn't have a pro team in Pittsburgh, so I adopted the Sixers. And I can remember looking across the room to my dad saying, I'm going pro, Dad. <laughs> what did he think? Well, he didn't say much. He just sort of chuckled and shook his head. But in his mind, he's probably thinking, Where'd that come from? Or what's he thinking about? But uh, I thought back then that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a pro either in football, basketball, or baseball. And uh, the third thing that I think of when I think of mom and dad uh, is depression. Because depression played a major role in our life uh, growing up and even as a major thread even to this point today in some of our lives. So those were three memories I had with mom and dad and then three fond sports memories that I can remember. I go back to fifth grade when I started really playing some organized sports, uh, or actually before that, I was about eight years old and I started with, uh, the De Haven Mets playing T-ball. And, uh, I can remember being behind Rogers elementary and hitting 36 
home runs off the tee. Big <laughs> deal. As you can tell, I can still remember it as a big deal. And uh, <laughs> then I think of my fifth grade basketball team. Uh, Coach Tomacek used to load us up in his station wagon. There was no seat belts. We were rolling around, zero safety at all, driving <laughs> through the city of Pittsburgh. We played 48 games, Austin. 48. We were 42 and six. And you can imagine, as a fifth grader, I was like, the NBA, we were, it was awesome to spend every <laughs> afternoon playing a basketball game. But my fondest memory, or I should say maybe the memory that has stuck with me, was my first snap. I was excited to start playing football, and I was always in my dad's ear prior to that saying, hey, dad, I want to play running back. And my dad, being an encouraging dad, said, listen, you know, share that with your coach. Ask him if you can do it. But at the end of the day, play whatever your coach tells you to do. Now, you and I both know that's a little different thinking than there is today. We're both coaches. Sometimes parents aren't always saying do what the coach says. So I ended up going to fifth grade practice, and uh, first couple weeks I was playing running back. And then uh, shortly after that, our head coach, Coach Acri, came to me and said, Ken, can you play some quarterback? He said our quarterback got an injury, and I wasn't real fired up about it, but I remember my dad's voice in my ear. And I said, sure, coach. And so he gave me the play. I got in the huddle. I called the play. And as a good quarterback does, like my boyhood hero, Terry Bradshaw, I swaggered to the line of scrimmage. And I looked to the right, and I said, blue 80. I looked to the left, blue 80. And I jumped away from center. And Coach Acker said, Karcher, what are you doing? And I said, he just went to the bathroom on my hands. <laughs> How did True you play story. quarterback after that? I don't know. True story. I won't say his name. I don't want to embarrass him. But as you can imagine, that was traumatic for two fifth graders. And to answer your question, I don't know. Because for 20 more years, I would put my hands under the center. So either I'm not real bright or I've got, you know, uh, I'm very brave. One of the two. But, uh, no, th those were, were uh unforgettable, unforgettable memories in those early years. And then into the high school years, Things went well. Uh, I was on a baseball team in 1980 called the Big Blue Machine. To this day, we're, we're known as one of the top three baseball teams in the state of Pennsylvania. I was very successful as a pitcher. I was 27-1. and one. With that came a lot of accolades. As a senior uh, football player, I was named the Parade All-American, was highly recruited all over the country. So for me, those early 18 years, Austin, they're fond memories. It, it seemed like everything was working out. Everything was great. I had placed so much of who I was in all that. And there's three words that would sum up those 18 years. And the, the first was applause. You know, I, I, I received a lot of applause and I loved it. The second was depression, as I shared with you. And we'll talk about how that affects our life later. And the third was recognition and it became an addiction. I became addicted to recognition as I continued to grow in my life. Share with us a little bit about your early years, Austin. Um, so as I thought about how to present my story, um, the verses that came to mind were Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Those verses are a parable that Jesus tells, and it's the parable of two builders. There's a foolish builder and there's a wise builder. The foolish builder built his house on uh, sand. The wise builder built his house on the rock. Well, in both cases, storms of life came. In the Bible, it uses literal storms. It talks about how rain came down and streams rose and how the wind blew. Both houses experienced those elements. The house that was built on the sand fell to the ground and was completely destroyed. The house that was built on the rock was able to withstand the storms and the structure was still there. Well, you know, the sand represents in this story uh, a temporary foundation, something that is performance-based. The house that is built on the rock, it represents uh, something that has an eternal foundation and, um, and it's truth-based. So, you know, how does this apply to me? Well, you know, as I, I didn't do it intentionally, but as I go back and I think about my life, I, I built my, my house on sand. 
you know, um, you know, another way of you talking about foundation is your identity. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I put my identity in performance based things, which when everything was going well and I was performing, it was great. When everything wasn't, you know, as you can imagine, well, mm. here's some of the things that building my house on sand look like, you know, the first thing would be, you know, I'm your son. So I took a lot of my identity based on your performance. You know, you being an NFL quarterback, I was the son of an NFL quarterback. You being a big time offensive coordinator in NFL Europe, I was the son of that. When you were the head coach at a division, a 1AA school in um, uh, at Liberty, you know, I took great pride of that. And, um, you know, uh, some of the other things that I put my identity in were my athletic performance. You know, I played football, basketball, and baseball. You know, on a day-to-day basis, I would go and, you know, either practice or play games and, you know, go and try to perform and achieve. Mm. You know, above all three sports that I played, there was one position that meant everything to me and that was the quarterback position unlike you who didn't want to play quarterback all I ever wanted to be was a quarterback um you know I can remember you know telling myself I I, you have to be the greatest quarterback ever to play one because I wanted to be better than you but then on top of that you know I wanted those applause I wanted that recognition I wanted to be seen Mm. You know, other things that I built my identity on or my house on was, you know, my school performance. You know, as a student, you know, I worked very hard. I would uh, put a lot of focus and time and kind of block out a lot of other areas of my life so that I could perform. You know, I was a 395 student in high school and I was a 398 student in uh, college and received recognition for that. You know, um, as a uh, now I'm no longer a quarterback, you know, I'm a coach. Well, as a coach, I go out and try to perform and win and gain recognition that way. I also uh, built my identity based on my Christian performance. Mm. And, you know, I wanted to look good and do the right thing. Well, that was all good when everything went well. But like I said, those were temporary circumstances. Well, Here's what some of the negative things that happened in my life, you know, um, and and how it affected my identity. You know, just like in the parable, it talks about how the rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew. This is what that looked like in my life. Well, I was the son of an NFL quarterback, a a well-known coach. Well, I became the son of a fired football coach. And even to this day, you're, you've still been trying to fight to get back to where you were. Well, I'm the son of that. You know, as far as an athlete, you know, I was a good athlete. I had great, many great moments. But, you know, at the end of the day, I will always be labeled as nothing more than a walk-on, you know, as a walk-on quarterback. As a quarterback, you know, at, at very best, I'm a, you know, I'm a backup. You know, uh, I did have, you know, some years where I started and I'm, you know, achieved. But at the end of the day, most of my career was a backup, you know, in regards to being a student. Well, that's great. I've got these great numbers and these great grades, but I don't I'm not a student anymore, (laughs) you know. And um, as a coach, you know, I've been on this journey trying to, you know, become a head coach, you know, get a program and and make a name for myself and that hasn't you know it's been years now that I've tried this and it hasn't hasn't come to fruition and then finally my Christian performance you know I believe for the longest time that A plus B equals C A the circumstances that are given to me B you know doing the right thing within those circumstances should equal C blessings Mm -hmm. well what I've found is blessings don't always look like what you want so as you can imagine when you built your house on sand and um you know you don't get what you want you know your house falls apart and, it, and you become broken 
you know, um, my brokenness looked like two things. It was depression and it was humility. Mm. And I'm still working through some of that stuff as I'm sure so many other people are as well. And, um, as I work through it, what I can honestly sit here and say, and I always want to take us back to the truth is although that might be part of my story, that isn't my whole story because my God, our father, he is about restoration and he's begun to take those pieces that, um, of my house that I, I put my identity in and he started to rebuild them. And what I'm seeing is awesome. Mm. But what I'm also seeing is, um, some of those things that I place my identity in, I don't look at them the same way as I once did. My perception has started to change. And for that, I am extremely thankful. With that said, there's I still carry a lot of hurt and pain over, you know, my my broken down house. So, I mean, that's a little bit about my story and um I'm there's a lot more to do, go, and I know there's a lot more details within it, and I'm sure we'll get into it. But if I were to describe it, it's the parable of the two builders. Well said, Austin. You know, it's amazing you use some words that we'll obviously dig deep into uh, in the future podcast between each other and with our guests. But that word performance, you know, that's a word that comes back to haunt us all the way back to the garden, thinking we've got to do to become instead of us recognizing that we already are and we already can be. And, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me, uh, I guess, rest when I hear you talk about, you know, the struggles we have, but yet we can look at how Papa accepts us, how he views us and that he is right with us in the middle of our story and our journey and the things that we're walking through. You know, there's a lot of people out there that we'll talk to that are coaches. There'll be some that aren't. But I think the question that uh, pops up a lot in my mind is, so you want to be a coach? So you want to be a coach? You know, why do you coach? I think of mom has often said to me and reminded me in some of my toughest times as a coach that it is a high calling. Coaching is a high calling. And I think we both feel that way about it. So thanks for sharing your early years. And, you know, for me, the next 18 years really were chronicled by four major events. The first was national signing date. I was a highly recruited athlete coming out of high school, had multiple opportunities, and I chose to go to Notre Dame. And to be honest with you, I got caught in a hype. Uh, I had really, in my heart, wanted to go to Miami of Florida. My dad encouraged me to take all my visits and I ended up visiting Notre Dame last, and they did a good job of selling me on the hype, and my ego bought it and ended up spending two years there uh, playing quarterback. I got to play a little bit as a sophomore, but I never felt like I was going to be the guy and that the offense that we were running would give me the opportunity to go pro, as I said back in my basement to my dad. So I transferred uh, to Tulane University. I know that's not the uh, – football powerhouse school, at least it wasn't then. Uh, they're actually doing better now. But I can remember playing an SEC schedule. We played everyone in the SEC except for Alabama and Auburn. So you can imagine the beating <laughs> that I took and we took. There's probably still body parts on the, uh, the uh, Superdome turf if you were to go down and look. But anyway, it gave me the opportunity that I wanted, and that was to be able to, to possibly be drafted. And that was the second major event, April 29th, 1986. I'll never forget the day because I was projected to be drafted somewhere between the third and fifth round. And on that day, Austin, 33 quarterbacks were drafted. And I wasn't one of them. To this day, I still don't know why. I wasn't doing drugs. And uh, I was floored that afternoon, as you can imagine. And I had my mom and dad were there, my roommate, my agent, and uh, at that time, my girlfriend. Uh, and so it was uh, devastating. And it was, I think, two months later, maybe, that uh, my girlfriend came up to me and said, you know, I want you to know I committed my life to Christ. And I was like blown away. And she said, anyone that was able to respond from the greatest disappointment in their life, 
I knew there had to be something special about your Jesus. Well, what makes that special to me, it's that girl is my wife of 37 years and your mother. So, uh, you know, God, once again, takes circumstances, as you said, that look like A plus B, and sometimes they turn out Z, but they're (laughs) for a purpose that uh, he knows is much greater. And so I would never trade that for anything, even though it was very hurtful at the time. And then the third major event was I bounced around in the NFL being a free agent, not really getting much opportunity, and I found the opportunity presented itself to be on the scab team. There was a strike in 1987. I should have known it was coming after having that center go to the bathroom on my hands as a fifth grader. But I got into the NFL through the strike league, and I played well. remember beating the Raiders on Monday night and was kept on the team that following year, and I found myself in Super Bowl XXII, which was the next major event in my life. Never did I dream that I would get there. Threw a touchdown pass that year also uh, against my hometown team, the Steelers and Three Rivers. And then I was also at Denver Seminary at that time because I thought I was going to be a pastor when football ended. I can remember two of my buddies, one on the right and one on the left, asking me, why in the world do you want to be a pastor? And I looked at them and I thought, well, you're in the same seminary. Why do you want to be a pastor? (laughs) And I said, what do you think I should do? And they suggested that I should coach. And that was really the first time I ever contemplated it because, unfortunately, most of the coaches that I've had in my life, I did not want to emulate the way they treated me. And I had a bad view of coaching. And uh, just at that time, a buddy of mine, or not a buddy, but a former uh, coach that was an assistant coach on one of the teams I played He got a head coaching job and he asked me to come and help work with his quarterbacks. And, you know, I still wanted to play pro ball. He said, listen, if you get picked up, go ahead and go, but we need some help at quarterback as a coach. And so I did. And I find out over an eight week period, Austin, which I know you and I believe at the core of our being that, that all sport, but in our case, football is a tool and it's a tool that can impact the lives of players, coaches, fans, alumni, And uh, I really believe that uh, God uses uh, football that way and sports to touch lives. And so that started me on a journey of coaching. And uh, in my early years of coaching, had some great success. And you'll hear even today on television, there's a period in time that every coach gets hot. Well, for me, it was in uh, 1998. We won the World Bowl championship for the Rhine Fire in NFL Europe. Great times, I'm sure. Uh, As we talk about, you know, those times over in Europe were wonderful, not only on the field, but I know we as a family really enjoyed it. And I know you have lots of memories with your siblings there, but uh, I had the opportunity to stay as a head coach in that league with the Berlin Thunder. And I also was presented the next day an opportunity to be the head coach at Liberty University. And actually on my way to the press conference, because we accepted the Liberty job, the Tennessee Titans called and asked if I'd be interested in uh, interviewing for the quarterback coaching job. But we felt like mom and I that, uh, you know, with you guys growing up that we needed to come back from Europe. Mom couldn't keep doing that three months out of a year homeschooling. And we had already felt like that, you know, planning roots in a college town would be the best thing for us. So, you know, we, we really felt like as a family that the mission of Liberty University, which was training champions for Christ, was the perfect fit. Little did we know that down the road there would be a perfect storm. How did you sense this perfect fit in your life, Austin, through your eyes? Well, you know, obviously I was younger, but, um, you know, looking back at it, you know, football presents itself as a perfect fit because (laughs) it gives you the ability to bring all three of the things that we loved, you know, and make them interconnected, you know? So, um, to me, the three things that, um, are interconnected are our faith, family, and football. And especially at Liberty that gave us, or gave you the great opportunity to do that. And, um, you know, as I look at perfect fit and how it fits into my life, I look at it two ways. I look at it back then, but I also look at it now. You know, back then, you know, it was a perfect fit because as far as my, um, as far as my faith, you know, 
I was saved when I was five and, you know, I was growing and, and, and strengthening my faith in, in, uh, Jesus and what he did for me and, you know, God. So, you know, I was a follower of Jesus Christ and, um, you know, family was a big part back then. You know, I look at you, um, my mom and then my, my, uh, three siblings, my two younger sisters and my brother, um, we uh were i mean we've lived all over i mean i've lived in 11 different states and as as well as europe for me it it um it had brought us closer as a family because that was one of the most consistent things in our lives so you know um it allowed us to you know bring our faith and our family into this new world of football you were the head coach at Liberty and I was a quarterback and I was starting to grow into that and really desire, um, achieving, uh, in that position. Well, that was a perfect fit back then, but for me now, you know, it, that fits still here, you know, um, I'm still a follower of Jesus Christ and I would describe it now as really chasing after the heart of the father. The second thing is, you know, my, um, you know, my family is still you guys. You're still around, and I'm thankful for that. But my family has grown. I got my beautiful wife, Lauren, who we talked about earlier. And, um, you know, she's from Northport, Alabama, which is right next to Tuscaloosa, home of the Crimson Tide. And mm -hmm. um, she, um, I couldn't do this life without her. Um, she does so much for us, me and my family. And, uh, you know, she's truly the rock in our family. And then, uh, you know, I got uh, four kids, and I've been blessed with them. I got Ella, Abel, Harper, and Remy, the oldest being eight, and the youngest being, you know, two going to be three here shortly. And, um, you know, so I got my own family now. And um, also, you know, what was my quarter, you know, back then it was the perfect fit of me being a quarterback. Now it's me being a coach. So really, you know, the perfect fit was there back then because of how interconnected the three things that mattered to me in life were and the perfect fits there now. Yeah. So, well, as I said, we, we both believed it was a perfect fit and, uh, November 18th, 2005, I figured out that we were ready for the perfect storm. I was, uh, told that that day that I would no longer be needed and, uh, it was tough. You know, I just uh, received a brand new five-year contract. And uh, in that sixth year, we ended up going one in 10. And I I believe that uh, even though that we had that tough year, that we were on the right course and thought that, uh, you know, in my conversations with uh, Dr. Falwell, that that would be the case, but it was time to move on. And for the first time in my life, at least the first time I really experienced it, we were going to go head-to-head -head or face-to-face -face with rejection, uh, betrayal, and depression in ways that I couldn't even imagine. You mentioned talking about rebuilding our family faith in football, and that's really what it was in 2005. Uh, we lost everything in one day, as you mentioned, being interconnected. Uh, everything from my job to you guys being in the Christian school that was tied to, to Liberty, to mom working within the ministry— it all blew up in one day, and uh, we felt alone. And for the first time, I felt what brokenness was. And I remember sitting in a FCA banquet one night, and a friend of mine actually and his wife were the keynote speakers, and they were sharing about their life, and they brought up the word brokenness. And I thought, what's brokenness? I mean, I, I understand disappointment. But what's brokenness? And little did I know that we were getting ready to experience it. And, you know, I had been fired, uh, or not fired, I'd been cut as a player. So I figured, well, heck, you get fired, you move on. But that that uh, that didn't happen, and this was different. And we ended up finding ourselves uh, in a counseling office in South Georgia, Mom and I, and we were hurting and uh, really were struggling. As you mentioned, Mom got very sick through this uh, this period of time. And I can remember the counselor recommending to Mom and I to to try this church that was up by where we were going to buy our home. 
in uh, Georgia. And I remember saying this to her. I said, uh, Bonnie, I appreciate the uh, recommendation, but, you know, this family, we're not going to church because if what we just experienced was Christianity, we don't want it anymore. And we're questioning, you know, I questioned, did God even care about us? And so we didn't, uh, you know, have any plans to go, but I did call that afternoon as I, Bonnie recommended for me to do. And I remember reaching out to the pastor, his name was Herb. And I said, Herb, my name is Ken Karcher. I'm just calling because it was recommended to call you. I said, I'm not coming to your church. I said, we're a family. It's really messed up. And uh, I said, uh, but I just wanted to follow through. And he, his response shocked me. He said, well, you'll fit right in. And I, I, I was taken back by that. And we didn't go right away. I don't know if it was a weeks or months, a month or so, but I can remember going Austin and you guys probably don't remember this because you were still somewhat, uh, the kids were little, you were getting ready to be a, a junior, a senior, but I don't know if you were with me this day. We walked in like this, but I can remember this lady coming towards me and I asked her a question that is a big part of our ministry that we talk about a lot. I think we'll get into it next podcast, but I said to her, how are you? And I never forget as loud as she could do it. She was probably in her seventies. As I mentioned, she yelled horrible. And I thought, wow, how refreshing to think that God loves her and she loves God. And yet she was able to say on that moment, she was horrible. The transparency shocked me. And we got introduced at this church to something called the ride, which I'll talk much more about in, in depth in further podcasts. But what it was, it was a community where you could basically share your story and walk with others through your pain. And uh, the way I summed it up was a place where weakness was accepted and life was understood. And so the ride environment was something that was brewing in my heart and that was something that helped us work through brokenness towards what you talked about a little bit earlier, and that is restoration. You know, our life is not built on brokenness, and it's something we went through. But what we want to talk about is what does it look like as your life becomes restored and you awaken to the fact that, wow, Papa's already put me together whole. How do I live from that reality? So the perfect storm was very difficult for us, but we're on the back end of that, and we can see how it's been used to help restore us. Give us your thoughts, Austin, of how did you see this perfect storm through your eyes? Well, you know, like we talked about, you know, the perfect fit set up for the perfect storm, you know, because all three things that were very important to me and you and and the people and all the people in our family, you know, were so interconnected. Well, what happened is when you got fired. You know, you know, we, when you got fired, you know, my junior year, two days before my state championship, when one thing went, it all went, you know, I can sit back and I can remember, you know, obviously kind of the humiliation, you know, uh, my coach saying, hey, you don't have to compete in this uh, uh, state championship game because, you know, he was a close family friend. And, um, you know, obviously I was programmed my whole life to overcome circumstances. So I said, I want to compete. I want to play because if my chance came, I'm going to be ready. Obviously, at that time, you know, my, it hit my mom very, very hard. She put a lot of her identity in us as kids and, you know, you uh, and what you were accomplishing and so she began you know to lose it and um, you know she was put into a psych ward and she was suicidal and you know wrote you a note and um, you retreated back to the house well um, <laughs> you know obviously um, I'm a junior in high school trying to process what's happening to my family you know, I sit back and I think, uh, you know, I can get back to that feeling, all those emotions. And um, if I were to put them into words, it would be uh, pain, hurt, betrayed, angry, and alone. Mm. If, um, you know, before I get into this any further, I want to make sure you understand, you know, yes, this happened at Liberty and there were, 
people associated with liberty that really caused a lot of pain in our lives. Um, but it's not their fault. It's not their story. I mean, really what it was, if I'm being honest, it goes back to the way I described my story earlier. I mm -hmm. built my identity. I built my house on sand. It was just tested. Mm -hmm. So how did I deal with this? You know, um, you know, uh, I, in high school, you know, with everybody gone and, you know, um, you know, me and my brothers and sister would go to school and, uh, my way of kind of dealing with all these emotions that I couldn't really express to people because the school was connected to the university and my church was connected to the university and uh, everything was connected. So I couldn't tell anybody. I just had to deal with it. Well, my way of dealing with it was through, um, was through a painting. I, I took all those emotions and put it on a canvas. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, back then, you know, it started as a pointillism assignment where basically you make small little dots. And uh, at the time, you know, I, I tried to do it and uh, eventually I said, forget it. I just I'm just going to paint and I'm just going to pour my emotions here and I'm going to do the best I can. And and just it's just going to be raw and it's going to be what it's going to be. Well, basically, in that painting, um, you know, I painted. You know, in the background is this Liberty Stadium, and I have my dad on his knees on the sideline with his hands reaching up to the sky, you know, and um, I, uh, you know, I have my mom in the background in the stands um, with her hands over her face um, crying, and then to the right of my father was um, a picture of the earth with an eye representing the world's vision. And then over here was like this radiant, beautiful eye representing God's vision. And in front of the world's vision was my dad's record. And to be honest, I, I don't really know if that was your record, but that really wasn't the point, you know, because we know it's a performance-based society and they're going to view you based on how you perform. But I also knew all that my dad did and who he poured into. So on the other side, you know, I saw, had God's vision. And he was looking at a bunch of different players or people that my dad impact that I witnessed as a as a young kid. And um, I can remember taking that painting home. You know, it's not the most perfect painting, but what it was is it was real because it was where I was. Mm -hmm. And I took it home to you and I said, um, Dad, um, this is a. Uh, This is for you. Mm. And I wanted you to know that I saw what you have done, even though other people did not. And for me, I purposed in my heart that I was going to redeem your name. Mm. And not only was I just going to do it as a quarterback or, you know, later it's kind of even evolved into being a coach. You know, I wanted to make your name, you know, what I know it is. And I'm sitting here 18 years today, and I still like I feel I don't feel like I've done that. But uh, what I do know is I know that um, that's not the answer. The answer is not redeeming your name, mm. because my life is really a reflection of what you believed, and what um, you preached and what you taught. And as I sit back and all the things that uh, I'm experiencing and walking through, even in this these few moments right now, I, I see your fingerprints of your life on mine. And um, to me, it's not about redeeming your name. It's really walking out the legacy of what you believed. Because for mm -hmm. me, you know, Anyone can believe it when circumstances are good because the house stands on sand when the circumstances are good. It's another thing when storms come. And for me, the storms came for my family and it came for me. And, um, you know, 
I was, uh, you know, God's begun to rebuild it and restore us and be able to walk through it. And what what God has shown us, what we believe, stands firm regardless of the circumstances. Amen. But anyways, as I get my composure, anyways, um, and a year ago, you you um you were about about to finish uh your head coaching job over at a junior college in Mississippi, and um you called me in that summer and you said, Austin, I want you to start to draw me a a logo because I want to start a ministry, and I want to call it Win Awakening. And um you know so. You gave me a couple parameters. You told me I want it to be black and gold because I'm from Pittsburgh, city of champions, like you said before. Yeah, and then, terrible towel, terrible towel. <laughs> well, good luck. Um, and then they are uh, going to win tonight. They yeah, are going to beat Buffalo. Just remember, I said that. Go ahead. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so black and gold. You said uh, maybe something with an eye or something with like a sunrise because. Um, because we're talking about awakening. Well, you know, I went to work and, you know, I did a couple drawings. I probably did somewhere between 15 and 20, and we just had to keep tweaking it. It just wasn't what you envisioned. And then finally, around the 20th one, you said, this is it. And what it was hmm. was a, uh, you know, like a football-shaped eye, you know, and it was a sunrise in the middle of the eye with it, you know, glowing or the rays going outside of it, and it said when, and then awakening, right? Well, we liked the logo, so that's what we went with. But it wasn't until you finished your season at uh, East Central, you uh, began to pack to move to Coleman, Alabama, where mm. um, I, my mom was helping out my brother-in-law, and um, you guys were about to move out that way, and you were going to start this ministry. Well. As you're going through your um, your garage, you come across um, you come across the painting I painted 17 years before, and I can remember getting a text from you and you saying, "Austin, do you remember that painting you painted when we got <laughs> fired at Liberty?" I said, "Yeah, what about it?" You said, uh, "I think that was the birth of this ministry." Mm. Because I went back and I looked at that uh, God's eye, which was sitting to the left of that painting, or if you're looking at it, the right. And you said, uh, it's the same logo. Mm. We weren't awakened to it then, but God had this ministry on your heart and my heart from the very beginning of our brokenness. So enough about, you know some of those feelings tell me a little tell us a little bit about the wind awakening first of all thanks austin for sharing your heart uh it's amazing like you said it still can be raw i go back to that day i was moving and i went in the garage and i was blown away i couldn't uh i couldn't put into words what i saw because you're right the logo was the same what is the wind awakening well the wind awakening is a sports ministry network to coaches athletes, and those who lead. WIN stands for, the W stands for wholeness. What does it look like to live and coach and compete from a place of wholeness? The I, which is the cornerstone of that three-letter word, is identity. What is your true identity? What is my true identity? How do we live from it? In the end, what you came up with is a little play on the word known. What does it mean to be known by God and to know him. So our vision is to awaken hearts and minds one story at a time at the win awakening. The mission is to empower leaders to live from a place of victory as they awaken to their wholeness, their true identity within environments that they can truly be known. And our goal is to create environments where people can be transparent and vulnerable and accepted right in the middle of their mess where they will be recognized in regards to their value and worth on a day-to-day -day basis, not by what they do, but by who they are. 
Austin, you also came up with five great core values. Would you share those with our audience, please? Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're all based on the gospel. And, um, you know, for me, it starts with, you know, the first pillar, which is heal the brokenhearted. You know, we're, we're emotional beings. God created us that way, and we're created in his image. So I believe he's an emotional being. Mm. And um, I think... You know, a lot of times, especially in the sports world, we try to uh, try to cancel out or overlook or, you know, basically not go there. You know, what I mean, it's uh, but those are things that we have to deal with. And I think uh, what uh, this ministry at the heart is we want to help heal their broken hearts. Now, it's not going to be us. It's going to be God. But like you said, creating the environment where you can be vulnerable and you can ask difficult questions and you can get answers and quiet from God, you know, um, one of the things, we just want to help in that healing process, you know, because we've been there. Um, the second th The second pillar would be to draw out the true identity. You know, um, once you know, we, we experience some healing. The next part is we want to start to rebuild that house or be a, a part of that rebuilding. Well, when we rebuild that house, well, what we have to do is we have to understand the identity that's always been in us. We just haven't been awakened or believed in it mm -hmm. because of what Christ has done for us. You know, it is finished. And because it is finished, we are children of his. And what father doesn't love their child and want them to experience the best life that they can? So in order to do Amen. that, in order to do that, you know, we have to understand who we are, or we got to first understand who he is, and then we have to understand who we are in relation to him. Well, in order to do that, we have to, uh, or we want to be a part of helping draw that out. It's funny, Dad, I heard uh, um, Teddy Bruschi uh, he was talking about uh, Bill Belichick and him um, recently um, moving from, away from the New England Patriots. And he said that on his little post on social media, he said that what Bill Belichick does the best is he's like a, a wet towel. He takes <laughs> that wet towel and he wrings it out to where all that water comes seeping out of that um, towel. He gets the best out of that towel. Well, that's all we want to do is we want to draw out what we already know to be true about you. And mm -hmm. we want you to recognize that because that is part of rebuilding that house on the rock. The third, the third pillar of the core value is we want to anchor your hope. Because, you know, in the Bible, it talks about, um, you know, uh, we want uh, to have hope as an anchor for your soul. Well, what that's talking about is. What an anchor does is when you're in a boat and you're in some body of water, well, you put an anchor down that weighs a lot and it helps keep the boat where it's supposed to be. Well, when the storms of this life come and they try to move your boat this way or that way or this way or that way, your boat might start to move, but that chain that is connected to that anchor brings you back to where you're supposed to be. Well. By drawing out your identity and anchoring yourself to the truth, which is Jesus Christ and what he came to do, die on the cross, raise again on the third day, and to give us life, you know, and now having the Spirit in us, you know, we have the ability to stand firm as the waves of this life come. Because we can't fix the circumstances. We're not going to have a perfect life. That's been promised to us. But what we can do is stand firm in the midst of all that and be able to take the punch and keep going. The next step or the next pillar would be to grow faith. You know, nothing great is accomplished without faith. That's all throughout the Bible. And all these things are true about our identity and all these things are true about our hope. But until you take the step of believing and living by faith in those things, you're, you're not going to be able to experience life. And our job is to help draw out the truth about your being. 
your wholeness, mm -hmm. your true identity, and to help you understand how you are really known. And when you understand those things, it sets you up for freedom, a freedom to live the best existed life, the best existence of life that you can, the one that God knew that you could live mm -hmm. and he gave for you. So, you know, those are our five pillars. And, and the way I look at it is it's the, it's the message of the gospel. I use words to share the gospel. You were loved in the very beginning. Well, he loves you in your healing process. You know, he's given you mercy. He sees you differently. He, he, his, um, the way he senses and experiences you is different than other people. He gives you grace, which is the free gift of his presence. Hope, you know, we have a hope because of what Christ has done. And then belief and faith, we believe it and it becomes part of our day-to-day -day life and we live out of that. And when we live out of that, that's when we get to experience the life, which, you know, in the Bible it talks about being a light or on a city on a hill or light in darkness. It's just different. It's different. And I've experienced glimpses and I'm excited about what God has in store for me going, moving forward. You know, Austin, the way we we win at the Win Awakening is uh, right now three ways. Uh, the first is what I call conversations with Coach K. Over this past the year, it's been a real blessing to to be allowed to be a part of people's stories and to hear what they're working through and the joys and the, the disappointments and just to come alongside them. You know, I have a, a note that I wanted to share from one of the coaches that he sent to me early on that really meant a lot to me. It says, thank you for always picking up the phone. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers. You're the one of my very few advocates during this event or episode. I would be a much more of a disaster without your ears and your voice. Words cannot express my appreciation for all that you've done and what you will do to try to help me walk this out. Thankful for you. I can't imagine trying to get through the journey without your encouragement. That's what we want the win awakening to be. The second thing that we offer is what we call win workshops. And that is a, uh, a weekend basically retreat to start. And then we would walk with you with follow up with the following months. Uh, there was a school in Florida that a uh, former player of mine, a coach in the pros. He's now a head coach. Last April, we did a retreat with he and his staff. And then for seven straight months, we'd do a monthly Zoom to follow up what we are uh, understanding about who we really are and how to live from it. And so that's another way that we can uh, make ourselves available to you to help you win. And the third is a dream that we have, and that is to have a place called the rest stop, somewhere that you can come and heal. And I just would encourage our listeners, if there's someone out there that wants to make that a reality or a few group of people that want to make it a reality, to where people can come and heal and, and understand their, their true identity as they walk their stories out in life. Austin, would you share with our listeners just a couple ways that they can follow us or, or learn more about us? Well, um, you've been putting out some weekly videos and blogs, and they've been showing up on Football Scoop, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and even now Instagram. So uh, there's some videos that, you know, um, get you to think and uh also uh hopefully uh get you to kind of assess you know uh your viewpoints on different topics um another way another thing uh is called andrew's journal okay uh, my my name's austin andrew karcher you know just like my dad was appropriately named you know i was always told growing up that the reason they named my middle name andrew was because Andrew was the first disciple to bring someone to Jesus. And um, even though he's not the most popular one or most well-known, he was the one that brought Simon to, um, brought Simon to, uh, um, to Jesus. So for me, um, I have some writings, um, just things that are going on in my life. And when God puts it on my heart, you know, I write it out and uh, I tried to uh, just be real. Um, and hope, and those are posted on our, uh, on our website. Okay. Winawakening.org. And, um, 
basically, you know, they're just food for thought and things that I'm working through. There's not a certain many that or amount that comes out or when they come out. It's just whenever God puts something on my heart. Another thing is we've had monthly coaches groups and coaches all across the country have gotten on and we've just been real and place of vulnerability and talked about what's been going on and answered questions and uh, really assess where we are and what we truly believe. So um, that's kind of been some ways we can find out more information about that. Let me also share with our listeners that if you're interested in finding our website, you can go to winawakening.org and uh, that should give you uh, access to everything that Austin shared with you. As we said at the beginning, the reason we're here today, though, is we're very excited about kicking off the podcast. And as we said, that uh, the podcast name is Awaken Kingdom Culture. And uh, there's multiple places in Scripture that you see the word awaken and awakening. And um, we're just real excited about walking alongside you as we help you in the process of awakening to who you are and what you really have. And uh, there's examples in the scripture. One that sticks out to me is the Apostle Paul when he is uh, on the Damascus Road. He's just been commissioned by the authorities that he can go kill those that are followers of Christ. And, and lo and behold, he has an encounter where he is face to face with the Christ. And he's awakened to the reality of Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so as we journey together, we're excited about that opportunity to to just remember that, you know, we were in Papa's heart and mind before time ever began. It was in the beginning that he chose us and he chose us to be loved. Austin, what about uh, some thoughts from you? Um, kind of my hopes for this podcast um, is, you know, a place to be vulnerable, you know, starting with us. But as people come on or, you know, conversation is... Uh, been directed. I mean, you know, we we pray for vulnerability. Um, we want to remind people of truth, you know, as things come up, and we want to draw out life. Um, so that's kind of my hopes as we um, continue with this podcast. As I mentioned earlier about some of the different types of guests we hope to have from all walks of life and all ages, um, we also have some topics that we hope to cover in our time together. And you know, you've heard us sort of share this within our own journey and our own story, but what is your concept of God? And what is your concept of self? We'll talk about that in the weeks and months and years to come. Another one we might look at is, you know, why do we coach? You know, like we talked about, this is a high calling that we have. We want to look at and really diagnose what is the heart of why we're doing what we're doing and spending all this time and energy uh, towards it. You know, what? What is the purpose? Another hot button that I'm sure we'll get a lot of response from is define winning. You know, what is the difference between winning versus victory? Um, another one we'll look at is grace in sport. Is it even possible? You know, we, uh, you know, we live in a performance-based society. We in sports, it's all about performance, and we get that. And we're not trying to um, change the culture. What we're trying to do is change our minds so we can function differently within the culture. Mm. Um, so um, we believe in grace and what's uh, what has been given to us. And with that belief, how does that affect what we do on a day to day basis, which is sports? And you know, something I've learned, probably the number one thing I've learned over the past 10 years is just the, that the most important person of my day is the one in front of me and that one matters and that you matter. And we'll look at that. And then also just the, the, as we've talked about creating place for transparency and vulnerability and how, how, does, how do we allow ourselves to get to that point in a performance-based industry? Um, another thing is what does it mean to be a kingdom coach? You know, what does it mean to be a kingdom coach? And as I have said to Austin many times, and those of you that I have had conversations with this past year, when you look at all of this, if our faith that we say is so precious to us, doesn't work out at two o'clock on a Tuesday or in the locker room after a tough loss or a big win, 
And is it really worth it? Well, we believe here that it does work. And that's why at Awaken Kingdom Culture, we want you to be encouraged. And we want to walk alongside you as you share your story with us. We're excited. Look forward to being with you next time. Have a great day. Bye.